go maybe uh, to number three here tomorrow because this is another type of operation that the Qassam, all of these videos from the last week, all of them from the Battle of Zaytun. Um, and here we see uh, the Qassam brigades monitoring uh, an IDF armored unit and underground setting, <clears throat> excuse me, setting a Shawath device underground remotely detonated. Um, the fighters are safe in a tunnel um, and detonating above ground um, against an Israeli force. And we're seeing now uh, pictures from the area showing smoke from the burning vehicles that were hit by that ambush. Um, and again, this is something that the tunnels are able to do. You can stack uh, munitions inside the tunnels and detonate them. Um, you can also lure um, the Israelis into booby-trapped buildings, which is what happened yesterday in Khan Yunus when the Israelis uh, admitted to 13 casualties in a booby-trapped tunnel uh, in Khan Yunus. And we haven't seen a lot of tunnel operations. And as I said earlier on in the war, the only way that the Israelis are going to uh, achieve their goals that they set out for Gaza is if we see a lot of underground operations, uh, because we know that there's hundreds of kilometers of tunnels um, that the Palestinians are using. Well, yesterday, the Israelis said that they just finished closing off the tunnel that we showed you on this program in early December the tunnel in the north, um, the attack tunnel that was so large that cars were driving through it. Um, the Israelis only yesterday finished with concrete, uh, with explosives, sealing that tunnel, um, whatever that is, three full months later. And that gives you a sense of how uh, challenging a task it is and how we're not seeing that happening uh, throughout the Gaza Strip because the tunnel that they closed uh, in the north, um, that tunnel is not in a built up area. So the Israelis were actually able to work in that area um, relative uh, in relative freedom compared to the other places that they would have to operate to, con to contain this tunnel network. Um, and so we're, you know, we heard, of course, uh, that they were going to flood the tunnels. We haven't heard much about that because it obviously doesn't work. Um, and we know from this tunnel example in the north that it takes them months to just close a single tunnel. And they don't, they're not closing the routes into that tunnel. We know that the, um, from the Israeli captives that have been released, that the tunnel network um, in Gaza is effectively a spider web. It's not uh, straight corridors between um, two places. So and you can see the fighters wiring in this video here uh, below ground, and now they're seeing a cameraman above ground. And again, we are seeing in these operations multiple levels of communication, and then these videos are released, are being released uh, immediately to the public. Um, so we're not seeing anything like the comms network being shut down during this massive operation into Zaytun. So let's go to the next one here tomorrow, because we have another way um, that Palestinians are setting bombs. This is a Shawaz above ground. Uh, this is an explosively formed penetrator, um, which is used against armored vehicles. We can see a fighter here moving to an embankment that the Israelis have created on this street in order to protect their armored vehicle corridors. And we see a fighter moving with the Shawaz device um, out to the roadside and then fighters above ground watching from a, a window as the device is set off uh, against um, uh, Israeli armored corridor, uh, uh, armored columns. And if we watch just one more time when we're going through, we can see this at 10 seconds of this video here. Um, you can see if you look at the building that's ahead there, that building is still smoking. Um, so these are active uh, battlefields that the Palestinians are operating on. And the Israelis are believing that by um, sending a belt of fire in advance of their armored vehicles, that they're preventing the resistance uh, from operating. But it's clear from these videos that that's not the case. Um, instead, they're ending up targeting civilians that are in these homes, um, not the fighters that are uh, participating in this, uh, in this battle, in the Battle of Zaytun. Um, was a division level battle. It was more than 10,000 Israeli soldiers invading um, Gaza City in an area that the Israelis said that they had already cleared Qassam fighters from. And they needed 10,000 soldiers and a two week operation. Um, and, and according to their objectives of digging up the tunnel network that splits the Gaza Strip, uh, that 
carries from the north to the south of the Gaza Strip, they weren't able to carry out that operation of uh, that tunnel operation. So it appears that the resistance in Zaytun prevented that and the Israelis withdrew uh, on the weekend. And that's when we saw um, what Nora was reporting on at the beginning of this show, um, the brutal atrocities of uh, killing Palestinian civilians who are bound um, to, uh, by uh, with handcuffs bound uh, and then run over while alive by tanks. Um, just horrific, uh, horrific finds that are hap that we see, we only see in Zaytun because the Israelis pulled out. These horrors are waiting f in, in places that people haven't come back home to, um, which is a whole other level of this conflict that we are going to see once uh, the Israelis pull back and Palestinians are allowed to go back to their homes. Um, the murder of civilians that we've, um, you know, that Nora documented in the news report really well. Let's do number five here tomorrow. So this is a Sarai al Quds operation. You can see them watching an armored bulldozer here from, I don't know how, for, for people that are listening, we're looking at an armored bulldozer that's only feet uh, away from the fighters. Um, and here we have uh, Sarai al Quds, the armed wing of Islamic Jihad, we can see this unit, and one of the things about the Sarai al-Quds videos is that they tend to follow uh, the, the fighters longer than the Qassam videos, which are more tightly edited. So we actually can see the fighters move from their um, positions inside a house where they monitored the bulldozer and then exit the house safely, moving through walls, moving under brush, and then attacking that vehicle that they were right beside in the building from an angle um, that's more advantageous than firing from the position they were in. All of these things um, pointing to, again, the, there, there doesn't appear to be any degradation to the overall operations of the resistance. And now we're watching uh, an Islamic Jihad fighter, uh, a set of fighters here laying a minefield um, using various types of explosives, moving through the rubble that Israel believes because they've destroyed this building, um, that it's no longer of military purpose, but the fighters are using it, using the undergrowth um, and wiring and the fighter here is holding what looks to be a Claymore mine, which is an anti-personnel mine um, that would be used within the minefield. Um, and you can see the fighter here burying this roadside bomb in the foliage uh, and, and, and creating um, uh, a minefield. And so we've seen this in the field reports when the fighters talk about minefields and detonating minefields among um, Israeli forces. But this is one of the first videos that we've actually seen them, um, uh, the, the detail that goes into laying um, that operation. And again, you can see that they're, they start this operation within feet of the Israeli troops. So there's nothing like clearing, which is what the term that the Israelis use, um, that they're clearing these areas. There's um, clearly that's not the case. Um, and we can see with this significant uh, roadside charge that's laid here, um, you can see the fighters here. We're watching them climb out the windows, stay along the walls for protection against the drones um, that are constantly watching from the air. We're seeing them now move through holes in buildings that they've knocked out, mouse holes to, uh, to move around. And then he'll move into the street here and fire. And maybe we can switch to the next one after he fires here tomorrow. The fighter moves, it's unclear uh, the result of that. Now we're seeing here is a Qassam tunnel operation in Zaytun, and we're seeing the fighter poke the last foot of, uh, of topsoil off and expose the attack tunnel here. And he pops up for people listening um, within, again, 25 feet of an armored vehicle um, and fires a Yassin at him. And so this is an interesting uh, view. We've seen a number of these tunnel operations, but we can see with this footage, the last that they don't dig these tunnels until they're ready to be used in the operation. Once the Israeli position is set, they can see through their tunnel network, which they have mapped and the Israelis have not, um, and see where the best place to, to uh, exit the tunnel to attack um, Israeli forces. And this is something that you see in, um, in all kinds of Israeli 
uh, field reports of their own talking about fighters coming up behind them, um, coming up through areas that they believed that they had cleared and attacking them from behind. Um, so we're seeing in this Battle of Zaytun a 360 degrees ambush of Israeli forces, and you're seeing it fought in three dimensions. You're seeing it fought from above. Uh, with shooters using elevated positions to fire from above. You're seeing them attack on the ground level. Um, and now we're seeing them attacking um, underground using the attack tunnel, which is covered. Um, and then the Israelis have the decision once this tunnel has hit this tank, which is too close for the tank's active protection system to engage. So all of the vaunted Israeli technical superiority um, is nullified by the Palestinians' ability to use tunnels um, and to use their homemade um, uh, RPG rounds um, that are still not showing any sign um, of depleted resources. This is Israel reinvading Gaza City after two months, and the fighters in Gaza City are still showing up with the same weapons, using appropriate weapons for the situation. There doesn't appear to be any shortage of these in these videos that we're watching. And again, these videos that I'm showing you today are all from the past week. We're still covering um, just the day-to-day uh, -day, uh, battle on the ground. Once the uh, the ceasefire takes hold, we can maybe rearrange some of these videos and show them in themes. But um, at this point, we're still covering the day-to-day -day, uh, resistance. So we can see a tank hit there. And we saw footage, we won't show it uh, on our show to keep these videos up, but we saw footage leaked today or uh, shown by the Israelis on their TikTok channels um, of a, a, a Yassin round uh, penetrating one of their armored vehicles and clearly very seriously wounded soldiers uh, inside uh, those vehicles. And so the vehicles are being penetrated by uh, these rounds, especially in the case that we're seeing here with something that is um, so close. And again, the fighters are returning to their base safely. These are not martyrdom missions. Uh, maybe we can go to number seven here tomorrow. Uh, because we see the Yassines being used in all different ways. Again, the, the, using the Yassin 105, um, the most dangerous of their anti-tank weapons, light, portable, easy to use. Um, and we're seeing them use the undergrowth here. We're watching them walk between buildings through holes in the buildings and coming out in firing positions. This one looks like it's about 100 feet uh, away from the uh, from the vehicle. And you can see there the uh, Yassin round uh, flying through the air. So they've got cameraman, multiple Yassin shooters um, carrying out ambushes with these weapons that are, um, that clearly do damage. Here we're watching a Merkava 4 tank uh, and a, a Tandem 85 be fired at that. And we see it being fired down um, the alleyway of this street which prevents the radar system um, that you can see there on the side of the tank. The uh, trophy active protection system requires radar to find the incoming round and, uh, and respond to it by firing out. When you're firing between buildings, when you're firing from under the uh, foliage or what we're looking at here, uh, firing from the uh, blown out wall of a building, uh, that has coverage on it, uh, it takes longer for the radar to pick that up. And you can see in that clip, the Yassin round go flying past. So we're seeing multiple shooters and cameramen uh, involved in these operations. We're watching them move through walls, which is something we've seen uh, throughout this battle. And the longer uh, the Israelis operate in this area, the more ability the indigenous fighters who live in this neighborhood otherwise um, are able to navigate the destruction that Israel has caused, which amounts to, and we've talked about this on other programs uh, as well, it amounts to military vandalism, what's happening, because they're not removing the military um, efficacy of these buildings that we're watching. We're watching fighters firing out of buildings that have been tank shelled, uh, but the building is still standing. There's no military purpose to it. And as you can see on the Israeli TikTok videos, um, when they're celebrating and cheering over this, they're not they're not picking military targets and then uh, all cheering. They're picking uh, soft targets and blowing up things 
uh, in their videos that don't have anything to do with the battle. Um, and as you can see in these videos, there be the battle space that they've created through this destruction um, is then used by the Palestinians to attack them. Um, maybe we go to the next one then tomorrow. So again, we're not seeing random pot shots. We're not seeing uh, the remnants of the resistance. We're still seeing these groups fighting in their formations. All the resistance groups filed reports throughout the battle uh, in Zaytun. We're watching largely Qassam and Sarai al-Quds because of the quant uh, qualitative nature of their attacks. Um, they have more fighters and better equipment. Um, and we're watching here a video of an RPG being fired by Sarai Al-Quds literally over the kitchen sink. Um, and somebody, the Israelis have just shelled that wall out of the house. Um, and this is what, when we're talking about partially destroyed houses, that's not a partially destroyed house, even though in the UN reports, that would be considered a partially destroyed house. Um, when your wall's been taken out of your kitchen, um, your house isn't partially destroyed. And here we see a, a Sarail Kud's fighter using a, a loophole uh, knocked out of the wall to fire RPGs. Um, multiple fighters, and we can see in this video, multiple fighters with RPGs. So we're seeing RPG ambushes um, that are taking place, multiple shots at the same vehicle, which again, um, because of the active protection system, it's difficult for it to reload fast enough to deal with a second round incoming. Um, also, the armor of the vehicles, if they're hit once, um, are significantly weakened for a second round. So what we're seeing here is Sarai al Quds firing multiple uh, rounds of their RPGs. Um, and we're seeing single warheads here, and, and we're looking at the armored column um, of the IDF moving through Zaytun. Um, during this battle. And again, it was a division level battle, 10,000 soldiers involved in this fight um, in an area where the Israelis claimed that they had uh, absolute operational control uh, months ago, which is just clearly not the case. Maybe we would go to the next one tomorrow, number nine. Um, and this is another uh, Qassam operation. Again, fighters out in the streets and able to move. And one of the reasons the fighters are able to move in the streets this way is because the Israeli soldiers are scared to get out of their armored vehicles. Um, and so they have no way of, um, of containing these kind of operations where uh, a fighter moves, watches the vehicles pass them from a safe point in the build in the building and then moves out in the street and hits them from behind in the most vulnerable spot on the armored vehicles here we're seeing a d9 armored bulldozer being hit um, and israel doesn't say how many armored bulldozers they have um, but we do know about their numbers of their uh, other armored vehicles um, and we know that we have seen as i reported last week uh, old armored vehicles, M113s, that the Israelis had said were taken out of service in uh, 2014 and also in um, 2004. Let's go to the next one here, 10 tomorrow. This is um, fighters using an elevated position to hit a Merkava tank here um, from a, a couple hundred feet max. And you can see the two-stage um, warhead there fire the initial warhead is launched and then the second charge flies out from the initial charge here we're going to watch an armored vehicle flying an israeli flag um, passing the fighters who use a hole in the building to hit the back of the tank before the active protection system can hit can be activated and so that's hitting the back door of their armored vehicle which is what uh the footage from today um showing the israelis in the back of their armored vehicle uh, that's what that looked like, a hit from behind because there's multiple soldiers in the aft uh, part of the, uh, in the fore part of the tank that are, don't seem to be injured. The people in the back seem to be critically injured in that footage that we're seeing today. Um, again, RPG uh, Yassines, indigenously uh, produced clones of uh, an effective anti-tank weapon that we're seeing in numbers um, that we've seen throughout the war, no indication um, of shortages of supplies, um, no drop in the tenor um, and cadence of uh, resistance operations anywhere, which has been the case for 100 years in Palestine, anywhere 
um, there's Israelis, there's uh, resistance. Anywhere there's Israeli forces, there's resistance. And whatever the battlefield um, uh, allows, that's where the, the the fight takes place. Sometimes it takes place in the in the form of uh, uh, boycotts and and uh, general strikes. Sometimes it takes uh, the shape of children throwing stones at tanks. Uh, and in Gaza here, we're seeing the resistance uh, fighting with Palestinian-made uh, weapons that they have prepared for the battle. And we're clearly seeing in this video um, damage being done. You can see the round incoming uh, on that freeze frame as well. And clearly a direct hit um, on the back uh, of that armored vehicle. So um, maybe let's go to number 11 here tomorrow because all of these uh, operations uh, lead to this. This is a Namer troop carrier, Kassam watching. This is the best footage, the closest footage we've seen of this, of extracting destroyed armored vehicles um, that the Kassam brigades uh, are recording from right up close. And you can see, um, for people listening, um, you can see the tow chain connecting the armored vehicle and uh, extracting the, uh, the troop carrier after it. And so we know that the Israelis, according to the Inst uh, International Institute for Strategic Studies, military balance, which is the, the main industry, uh, mag uh, industry journal for uh, the arms trade and um, for uh, international uh, militaries, they indicate that the uh, Israelis have uh, 400 Merkava Mark IV tanks 700 Mark III's, both of which we've seen in these videos today, uh, being hit, and 200 Namer troop carriers. According to Kassam figures, they fired, they've uh, carried out 1,200 Yassin uh, operations against Israeli armored vehicles, more than 900 of them tanks, 100 uh, troop carriers, like we're seeing right there, that's one of the 100, um, and 100 armored bulldozers. Um, and at some point, uh, the Israelis aren't able to maintain uh, this level of operation. It's one of the reasons why they're stalling the operation uh, into Rafah. They're also rotating their forces out of Khan Yunis, where over the last week, there's also battles uh, in Khan Yunis. Um, and so we're seeing uh, the Israeli military um, being forced to uh, to repair their gear. This gear is not an easy fix. You don't just put a metal strip on it and carry on. To especially a damage to the hull, a pierce to the hull is a months long fix before these vehicles are back um, in the field. So um, these are clearly significant um, damage being done, and these numbers at some point. Um, uh, might explain why we saw the M113s last week in Khan Yunis, although there was a report in Yedio Aeronaut uh, this week that suggested that the M113s might be actually uh, uh, unmanned um, and being used as weapons shuttles. Um, that that uh, that may be the case for those uh, M113s that we saw last week on the show because they were both destroyed completely. Um, so that's a, that that's one possibility, but the the significant possibility is that the Israelis are 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 stretched thin. They have forces on the border uh, with Lebanon in the north, which they're promising to attack to move um, Hezbollah forces off the border. The West Bank is preparing for uh, Ramadan and is on fire. Um, as I've said multiple times on this show, would be called an intifada at any other time. There's armed struggle throughout the West Bank that requires Israeli armored vehicles. Um, and then you have the tempo of this operation in Gaza. So there's, um, it's clear that they're, uh, they're running thin and also need to have a break. It's part of the reason why um, there's this timeline before Ramadan about the invasion uh, of Rafah. So let's go to the last one here tomorrow because this is a Palestinian fighter um, and he's uh, about to fire 120 millimeter uh, mortar rounds at the Israelis. He says, we promise Netanyahu who wants to dismantle the Qassam brigades that it is us who will dismantle your forces and send your soldiers back home in coffins. So we see the Palestinian fighters communicating and releasing these videos immediately, responding to news during 
uh, an intense battle in Zaytun, um, and still we're seeing the fighters able to communicate in this way. And this video with the fighter um, shows the uh, the highlights of that video that I parsed out. We're seeing the tank being towed. We see the fighters move through holes in the walls. Um, and, and we're seeing fighters communicate and being aware of what's going on in the outside world and responding immediately. In some of these videos from Kassam this last week, we saw the date written on it and the day of it being released. So these videos are being um, promptly sent out from their uh, information operations arm. Um, and, and so based on these videos and what we're seeing on the ground, um, the operation in Zaytun wrapped up, the Israelis withdrew from Zaytun, and that's when we saw um, the horrors that uh, that Nora reported on. So that's, uh, that's the resistance uh, update from this last week. And again, every video that I just showed you was from the past week. Um, and we're still, there's still more than enough um, that, that are, we're able to show uh, in, in these segments. So thanks for watching this video. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel, hit like, leave a comment. These engagements help us with the YouTube algorithm and it helps us to get around Silicon Valley censorship as much as possible. It does make a difference. You can also support our journalism by going to electronicintifada.net and clicking on donate now. Thank you.